chapter number 12. Now, of course, next week is going to be the last week of the Bible study going through the book of Hebrews. It felt like it flew by just like every you know, other time period in life flies by. So Hebrews chapter number 13 is really going to begin the conclusion. It really, uh, just like a lot of Paul's letters, uh, we're going to see in Hebrews chapter number 13 where he's giving these what seem to be almost unrelated statements back to back to back. This happens pretty often when you start to get towards the conclusion of Paul's letters. And then of course at the very end of the epistle, you know, he gives uh, you know, his salutations and, and mentions a few people. And uh, so here in Hebrews chapter number 12, I would consider Hebrews chapter number 12 the climax of the book of Hebrews. Now there's a ton of doctrine that is taught in the book of Hebrews. There's a ton of doctrine that is taught in the Bible. There's a lot of different, you know, uh, just teachings of knowledge and, and head knowledge, things that you just need to know. But really the main purpose of the book of Hebrews and the main purpose of the Bible is to get you to actually do things. It's not good just to have head knowledge and just to never use it, never to teach it, never to use it in whatever way that you could use it. Teach your children, teach other people. But a lot of the knowledge in and of itself is knowledge that you obtain and you acquire through studying the Bible, but then you actually put it into practice. That's the purpose of Hebrews chapter number 12. That's the purpose of the book of Hebrews. If you remember the overall theme of the book of Hebrews as far as the practical application to the reader is this, endure, have patience. That is the purpose of the book of Hebrews over and over and over again. It's about endurance and he uses different things in life to try to provoke you to endure. He uses the cursings of God upon the Christian's life. How the Christian will be punished. And this is actually the, the most famous chapter really about Christian chastisement from the Lord. A lot of the book of Hebrews talks about Christian chastisement, chastisement from the Lord. He uses the curses or Christian chastisement. He uses the blessings that you can receive. He, he tries to uh, encourage them and provoke them to endure and, and to have uh, you know, patience and continue in the faith in the sense of how great of a covenant that we have. And he goes through all of these things and he compares the old covenant in the new, uh, and the new covenant to show the superiority and just the greatness of it to try to push you to do more. Hebrews chapter number 11 was the faith chapter. What we're, we're going to be you know, uh, building off of that here in Hebrews chapter 12, of course, on the same exact thought that we ended in, there's a lot of continuity. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. We'll look at that now. It says this, Wherefore, seeing... We also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now there in the beginning, we see it starts off with wherefore. Now that's the same as therefore. So it's saying consequently or because of that, this. So we can see there's obvious continuity from Hebrews chapter 11 to Hebrews chapter 12. It says this in full, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. So it's saying that we are compassed about, right? And then it says this, with so, uh, so great a cloud. Great meaning large. Cloud. It's funny that he uses the word cloud because it makes you think of what? Physical clouds, right? But it's saying that these are, you know, so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, remember it says wherefore. So what were we talking about though? Who were the witnesses that we were talking about? Well, in Hebrews chapter number 11, that is considered the hall of faith. This is the faith chapter, and it talks about all of the great elders they're referred to as. How the great elders of the past, those that came before us, the patriarchs, kind of like elders in that sense. The patriarchs, their great faith that they had. And how we are, here in Hebrews 12.1, it's saying how we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Those witnesses are referring to those of the Old Testament. Now it's interesting as I said that it refers to a cloud. People will ask the question sometimes, you know, can the people in heaven you know, look down and see us? Well, from Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 it makes it sound like it because what are they referred to as? What is the, the title that they're given? Witnesses. Now what does a witness do? Someone exactly that sees or watches something. So what is the implication there? We're compassed about with so, so great a cloud, referring to the sky, kind of directing us to the sky, of witnesses. After speaking of those that were before us. This is a, you know, another you know, very uh, um, you know, uh, kind of indirect proof also that I believe teaches that you go to heaven immediately when you die. They're in heaven right now. You know, just like it talks about how Enoch was taken, he's mentioned in this. Notice how Enoch is, is mentioned in this and everybody else is also so great a cloud of witnesses. That's because when you died, Old Testament, New Testament, 
you go to heaven. There's two locations for the soul, heaven or hell. And they are in heaven, and I believe that they are able to see us. That's why they're referred to as witnesses. And that should be an encouragement to you. Remember, that's the whole purpose of the book of Hebrews, unlike any other book. There's a lot of provocation in the New Testament. There's a lot of you know, uh, uh, pushing you to do more and encouragement prodding you. But the book of Hebrews even more so. The theme of the book is endure, push forward, be patient. Amen. The word patient means endure. So he's telling you Moses is watching you. Elijah is watching you. You know, Joseph is watching you. Jacob is watching you. The same men that we read about in the Old Testament, they're watching you, Christian. And that should provoke you to live a better life. Even more so, it should be that God is watching you. Right. But hey, that's pretty cool that the, the Old Testament saints are looking down and they can see the way you're living your life. They can see the battles you're going through. They can see the, the great works that we accomplish as a church. That's encouraging and that should push you to do more. So the first thing is that they're watching us. That should be an encouragement. The second thing it says is this. He gives us this you know, uh, uh, admonition. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. So he says two things. Let us lay aside every weight. And then he mentions a specific weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. There's a lot of weights that can, you know, uh, pull us off the course. There's a lot of different things. You know, we, you can be worrying about something, stress, not having peace. You know, uh, there can be a lot of different things of this life that we can get wrapped up into, right? Uh, and then we can, you know, become distracted. And, but we need to lay aside anything that would pull us off the course. Anything, wh whatever it is, you know, working is good. Having a job is good. But if it starts to interfere with our lives, interfere with our Christianity, interfere with our spirituality, and we find ourselves lacking in our spirituality or lacking in our Christianity, we need to take, take it a step back. You know, if you feel like maybe you're working too many hours or something and that's affecting your, your, your Christianity, then you need to take a step back. You need to, you know, pull back a little bit because that needs to be number one. Whatever that weight is. But even more so, he mentioned something specific because this is the most common weight. The sin. It says the sin. And then it says this, which does so easily beset us. That's putting you back. That's what it means to beset. To move something that is set, something that is in line, to be set, it means to move it out of its place. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice that sin easily besets you. It's not difficult. It's easy to be moved off of your course, moved out of the race, pushed you know, out of the race because of sin in your life. You need to lay those things aside. And then it says you need to run with patience the race that is set before you. What does patience mean? mean or before us. Uh, it, patience means to endurance. It means to endure. It's not how we use the word patient today, like patiently waiting for something. I've showed this many times. We've seen it throughout the book of Hebrews being used interchangeably. We're getting ready to see it right now again. But the word patience means to endure. It's an older word. Uh, you know, it's a common word as day, uh, today too as well. But this, uh, uh, when it was used, it had a, a different meaning at that time. More so pointing towards endurance. So it says, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Also learn from that. We all have a race. We all have a, a course. God has a race for you. God has something that He wants you to do and things that He wants you specifically to do. And don't have this attitude that, well, somebody else can do it if I just pull back the reins a little bit. No, it won't get done. That's what will happen. He's got a piece of the pie for you specifically that He wants you to complete. And if you don't complete it, nobody will. If you don't knock on those doors, nobody will. If you don't do that good deed or whatever it may be, help out that Christian that maybe you know uh, isn't serving God or whatever it may be, nobody will do it. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus. This is while we're running a race. It's picturing Him being in front of us. right? He's already finished is what it's saying. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So there we see looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And then it says this. Here's another encouragement. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Notice endure being used there after he just told you to run patiently. It's using him as an example how he ran patiently. But it says that he endured. So notice why did Jesus endure? This is another good encouragement for the joy that was set before him. He looked forward to the reward. He looked forward to getting to heaven. He looked forward to all the blessings when we get to heaven. That's another encouragement to us. And then it says this is interesting, despising the shame. Jesus didn't just go through the motions when he came down and lived on this earth as a man. He despised the shame. He was a real true man. He despised being mocked. He hated being mocked. 
and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, one of the things I want to point out here is a very good verse. Notice it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's very interesting. He's the author. What does it mean to be the author of something? It means you're the, the, the inventor of it. You're the founder of it. You're the one that came up with it. That's what it means. That you drew up the plan. Now, I want you to go to the Old Testament. Let me get a bulletin here if you have one. I would use one as well. Go to Isaiah. Go to the book of Isaiah. We're going to look at a couple of passages in Isaiah. You can throw that bulletin in there at Hebrews 12. We're going to go to Isaiah. First, go to Isaiah 41, 28. The book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, the major prophets. Isaiah chapter number 41, verse number 8. So uh, 28, I'm sorry. Isaiah chapter 41, it's verse 28. I knew it's at the end of the chapter. It says this, For I beheld, this is God speaking, the Lord Jehovah of the Old Testament, and there was no man even among them, and there was no counselor that when I asked of them could answer a word. So notice he makes a statement, For I beheld and there was no man. Go to Isaiah 59. Isaiah chapter number 59, verse number 16. Isaiah chapter number 59, verse number 16, just to the right in your Bible. Notice this statement again. He sa it says this, And he saw that there was no man. Now this is speaking about the Lord. And he saw that there was no man and wondered. He was amazed, that means. That there was no intercessor. That means a mediator. There was no intercessor. Therefore his own... Or I'm sorry, I'm quoting uh, uh, the passage we're getting ready to look at. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. So notice that the Lord looked, he saw that there was no man. So what does he need? He needs a man. The Lord does. Jehovah. He looked, singular, one man, one person, one God. There was no man. And it says, and he wondered that there was no intercessor. He needed a mediator. What? Between God and man. That's what he needs, an intercessor between him and man. And there wasn't a man that could fill this gap. The Lord notices this. And then it says this. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it, it sustained him. So he needs a mediator between God and man. And what does that need to be? A man, because there was no man. There's no intercessor, there's no man. So, and then what does it tell you? He did it. His arm brought salvation unto him. What does that mean? It's saying that he became the intercessor. He ended up being the intercessor because there wasn't an intercessor. He ended up being the what? The man, because there was no man. Now, it's interesting, if you go to Isaiah 53, you know what it does? It actually tells you who the, the uh, man is, because it calls him the arm of the Lord. Right. The arm of the Lord, and then it describes the Messiah, the man. Perfect consistency. Now go over to Isaiah chapter number 63. We'll see this again. Isaiah chapter number 63, verse number 5. And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Notice that consistency. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. Notice the same statement. Notice he's just wording it in a different way. But he clearly says that he looked, he wondered, he was, you know, needed someone, but they weren't there. And then he says, therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me. Just in case you were wondering whether it was some other person's arm, he clarifies it. The one that looked and saw, the one that actually looked down and noticed that they needed a man, he saw, hey, there was no man. So you know what he did? He became the author of the plan and he said, I'm going to do it. And then he actually did it with what? His own arm. So notice that he's the author and he is the finisher. Now, what does Hebrews 12 say? Jesus, uh, it says in Hebrews 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Why? Because Jesus is that man. And the Lord is that man. Jehovah of the Old Testament looked down and he said, I need an intercessor. I need a man is what I need. I need someone to bring salvation. I need someone to bring righteousness. Therefore, I'm going to do it. That's why it says, mine own arm brought salvation unto me. Nobody else could have done it. There was no one else that could have worked. You see this here, but also in Ezekiel is a famous passage. It says, I sought for a man to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. You know what he says? I found none. All throughout the Old Testament, he's looking for a man. He never finds him. So you know what he does? He realizes this. Of course, he knows this. God doesn't realize things. He's the author of this plan. And then he finishes the plan. He becomes the man. And he brings salvation unto him. Notice the man that notices and looks down and sees I wondered, but there was no man. Notice that he actually is the one that completes the plan as well because it's his own arm. Right? This isn't another person. Don't try to tell me, oh, well, that, you know, the arm is just, you know, the second person, a totally different person. 
The person speaking says, mine own arm. My, my arm is not a different person than me. It's my arm. It doesn't have a mind of its own, like a separate mind and body and soul and spirit. No, it's my arm. And when I do something, I'm the one that's manipulating. The mind is here. The, the mind of, you know, Tyler, the person, reaches down and he does it. It works the same way with God. God's mind, the mind of the Lord, the God of the Old Testament, he looked, he wondered, there was no man. Therefore, he himself brought salvation unto himself. Go back to Hebrews 12. Jesus Christ is the author of and the finisher of our faith. He's the one that from the foundations of the world was going to save us, had this plan drawn up. It was already, you know, in his foreknowledge, in his mind, predestinated all of this as far as, uh, you know, how he was going to bring salvation. And then you know what he did? He actually completed the plan. He finished the plan. So we need to look at him. He's the author and the finisher. I don't have my faith in anyone else either. That's what you could say too. He's the author and finisher. You know, so when we look at the passage here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, what we can learn from that is, you know, just like how Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. It's, it's, it's Jesus. It's the Lord. He is the Lord of the Old Testament. That's who we have our faith in. Verse number 3, it says this, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Now, you don't have to turn there, but this uh, is also the same language was used in Hebrews 3.1. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So notice, consider him, right? Consider him. You need to stop and think about Jesus sometimes. You need to consider him because he can encourage you. That's what is being used here. And in this case, it says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. What did he do? He endured persecution. He endured, it says, such contradiction of sinners against himself. When it says contradiction, it's being used in the way of opposition. When you're contradicting something, you're against it. So right here, it's basically saying such opposition of sinners you know, against himself. Right? Against and contradiction are you know, being used there also kind of synonymously, so you could define the word that way. But it's talking about people being against him. And look at him. And then it says this, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. So we can look to him because he went through more than we did. And he was able to do it. So we need to look at Christ Jesus and we can find you know, motivation and encouragement in him. And even more so, it kind of hits on that same point. Verse number 4, it says this, Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Saying he did resist unto blood. He was beaten to a bloody pulp. And then he was hanged on a cross and, and, and died on the cross. You haven't went through that. So look at him. He went through that and he, and he endured it patiently. That's what it's saying. You know, being an encouragement unto us and our faith as well. But notice also it says, Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So what is he saying that's a, a, a very clear possibility uh, that, that they could endure? Uh, that they may have to strive against sin as far as against blood, right? You have not yet resisted unto blood. So it's saying that you could be persecuted to the point where you're bleeding, where you're being beaten, where it's actual physical persecution. That's what this means. Corporal uh, uh, persecution upon yourself. Look at verse 5 now. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. So right there in verses 1, 2, and 3, it's talking about being persecuted by the world. It's talking about being persecuted by those that are trying to harm us or hurt us, that are against us, that uh, you know, are, it's coming from, uh, from evil or from negative, right? The, uh, negativity. But here, now it's talking about uh, enduring uh, punishment from the Lord when we sin. And that's what we're going to get into now. And like I said, we've dealt with this a lot. Hebrews chapter 6, that's what Hebrews 6 is about. Hebrews chapter 10, we read about that. That's what Hebrews chapter 10 is about. The punishment of God upon His people. It says, the Lord shall judge His people in Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My, my son... Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. So notice this again is an exhortation. He's saying you forgot about this. This is an exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. You know, we may get numb to these types of things, but that is a great blessing to God to be able to uh, consider us and look at us as his child. Amen. As if, you know, how you look at your children, that's how God looks at you. He loves you. He wants the best for your life. He wants you to do what's right. He's prepared things for you. He's looking forward to meeting you. I mean, think about this. And he is your father. So this is a blessing. He said, you have forgotten 
the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. So this is an exhortation. And then he says this, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Chastening, of course, is a punishment. Uh, we're going to look at some passages. We have a few verses that we're going to be flipping to tonight. Go to Proverbs 3. I want to look at where these are quoted from. There's a lot of quotations in this chapter you may not have noticed. So Proverbs chapter number 3, first, verses 11 through 13. The Bible says, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. And then it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. So there, notice it uses correcteth in verse number 12. If you flip over, keep your hand there, of course, in Hebrews 12. Keep that uh, each time that we flip tonight to any other passage other than Hebrews 12. Make sure you slide something in there. If we would have read verse 6, it, it also quoted uh, uh, that other portion of uh, Proverbs 3, it was verse 12. It says this in verse 6 of Hebrews 12. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son to be received. So notice chastening and correction are used interchangeable. And, uh, and then also, read verse 13, because a lot of people think that these are totally unrelated, but they are actually related. It says, happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. How does someone get understanding? How does a child receive understanding? Through correction. Through them being chastised or being scourged. You know, uh, it talks about how, how foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from What are they going to get? They're going to get wisdom. They're going to get understanding. They're going to get knowledge. I want you to go now to the book of Job. The book of Job. Look at Job chapter number 5. Just back a couple of books right before the book of Psalms. Job chapter number 5. <clears throat> There myself. Job chapter number 5, verse number 17. It says this, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Very, very similar. It almost seems like it's quoting both of them kind of. Notice also at the beginning of verse 17 it says, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. That's why I made that connection between Proverbs 3, 11, 12, and 13, where 13 says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. You know what you find? Wisdom when God corrects you. When a child is corrected, they find wisdom. We should be happy when God punishes us and corrects us in our life. He's disciplining us. Our children should be happy. You know what that proves? That we love them and that they are a child. They have a father that cares. Look at verse number 6 again, and we're going to read this one more time here in Hebrews 12. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Notice every son. He punishes and scourges every son whom he receives. Why? Because we are all going to continue to sin. Every single one of us will continue to sin. None of us will go without chastisement because we'll all sin. There will be a reason for him to punish us. And, and there is no, he doesn't, he's not going to overlook it. He's going to punish us. Of course, in regards to going to heaven, he's forgiven all of our sins. But you know what? He, that's why he punishes the flesh. That's why he punishes us while we're on this earth. Because you know, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. I'm going to continue to sin in my flesh, but my soul has been sealed unto the day of redemption. My soul has been made righteous by the Holy Spirit. Amen by the righteousness of God. But my flesh still dwells sin. So if I decide to still walk in the flesh, I'm going to be punished in the flesh. That is going to be important in just a minute. I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 5. It says again, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. So this is spoken of a lot. God chastening his children. God chastening his sons. Verse 7 now. Look with me at Hebrews 12, verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So he's trying to, to prove to you that you're a son of God. You're a child of God, and this is an exhortation. If you're being chastened, that means that he's dealing with you how, he de how a, a father would deal with a son. So we should be you know, uh, grateful for this. And then he says, For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So if you live a sinful life, if you, you know, have, have, have you know, uh, committed some grievous, horrible sins, and you don't end up being punished, then you need to worry. If you are able to just get away with everything, nobody finds out that you're doing things, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're just living this wicked, sinful life behind the scenes, and you're never receiving any type of chastisement, well, that's scary because verse number 8 here is teaching that the only way that that would happen is if you're a bastard because God will punish you because he loves his children and he punishes all of his children or disciplines, if you will, all of his children. 
So verse number 9, it says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So he's saying, you know, again, an exhortation to, to be obedient to God, to follow God. He's saying, haven't you obeyed your own fleshly father? Well, doesn't, you know, the father of all, right? That was just your father. And maybe a couple of other children, a couple other siblings that you had, he was the father of. Well, it's saying in this sense that he's the father of spirits and live. Uh, I want to look at a couple of passages real quick. Go back to the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers, Numbers 16, that statement is also made in Hebrews 12, very similar to it, where it says in, uh, in verse 9, again, it said, Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Well, verse number 23 in this same passage refers to him as, you know, it says, The judge of all, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So it kind of ties those two things together. I want you to go to Numbers the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter number 16. This is actually a title of the Old Testament. I want you to notice that he's quoting the Old Testament like crazy. Almost every other verse, there's a quotation here. This is a title that he is borrowing from the Old Testament. Look at Numbers chapter 16, verse 22. And they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? Look at 27, 16 now. Look at chapter number 27, verse number 16. This is a, a verse that I uh, derived a title of one of my sermons for. It says in verse 16, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. So notice that this is actually a quote from the Old Testament, taking out Father and God, just using those interchangeably. So he's using a lot of Old Testament language because as I mentioned that this was going to take place and quoting a lot of Old Testament scripture because he's writing to people that should be familiar with the Old Testament. They grew up their whole lives being taught the law, memorizing the law. They should be familiar, so that's why he's trying to relate to them. You know, again, makes sense that it's Paul. You know, he talks about under the Jews, he was a Jew, right? So he wants to relate to them. He says in, uh, in, uh, in verse 9 at the end there, another important point, he makes this statement. I want to point this out to you and I'm going to come back to it. He says, Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Actually, let's go ahead and turn to it. Go to Romans chapter number 18. Romans chapter number 18. There is a passage that's oftentimes misunderstood here in Romans 18. Uh, I'm sorry, Romans 8. Yeah, I was saying Romans 18. Yeah, you look for that while I go to Romans 8. Right? Romans chapter number 8. <clears throat> Honey, there is no Romans 18. No, I'm just kidding. Romans chapter number 8. Look at verse number, look at verse number uh, 13 first. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So I want you to notice that there, it's spoken here saying that if you live in the flesh, you're going to die. So you're going to be punished by who? God, of course. He says, but if ye mortify, that means put to death, right? Crucify the flesh. If ye mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now, does that sound familiar? Remember the statement that I just read to you. It said, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Now, what's the context of Hebrews 12 when that's made? It's talking about what? The punishment of God. So what is being insinuated? What is being implied that if you live a disobedient life, what's going to happen? God could kill you. It would be from God, right? You could die, right? Because you're living in the flesh. You're walking after the flesh. You're, you're living a sinful life. So verse 13, I want to run it together with verse 14. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now notice verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So notice the tie-in with the sons of God. Why? Because God's the one punishing you. That's why he's saying, if you, if you mortify the deeds of the flesh, you'll live. You'll live. Why? Because God's not going to punish you. But if you live after the flesh, what's going to happen? God's going to punish you. Ye shall you know, uh, uh, possibly die, as it says there in Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 9. Uh, if you're in subjection unto the Father of spirits, and you will live, it says. Verse 10, it says, For they verily, talking about our earthly fathers, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now when it says they chastened us after their own pleasure, it's not just like they're sadistically getting enjoyment out of spanking their children or beating their children, right? It's saying because of the result, they chastened us for their own pleasure because they benefited him. But it's saying in this case, God actually has your best interest in heart. God actually cares about you becoming a good person. You know, 
to the parent, a lot of the times, it's so that you don't annoy us, right? A lot of the times, hey, I care about my children and I love my children, but who is less selfish, us or God? God, of course. You know, it's saying that God has your best interest at heart. God is worrying about you, even more so than an earthly father, when they did it because they want you to do what's right and you can actually benefit the household for a lot of reasons, right? Of course, I punish my kids because I love my kids, and I actually tell them that every time, after, but right, bef right uh, 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 before I give them a spanking, right before I do, and then I spank them, and then I tell them again that I love them afterwards and give them a kiss every single time I spank them. That's like a, a process, you know, a step-by-step -step process that I do. So I do it because I love them, but oftentimes you know, we do it because it benefits us too. Because the household's getting crazy, because you need them to do something and they didn't do it, and they weren't productive and it needed to get done. But for God, it's just saying that he's, in this sense, he's selfless. He's, he has your best interest at heart, and he's punishing you for your own good. That's the point. Now look at verse 11. Verse 11, it says, Now, no chastening... Oh, I'm sorry, let's finish verse 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Obviously, when you're being punished and disciplined, you're not enjoying it. You know, my kids, if you were to ask them while I'm spanking them, if you bent down and said, are you having fun? You know, they're not going to tell you yes. They're going to tell you no. It's grievous. It's not joyous. It's not meant to be. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So even though it feels negative right then and there at that moment, guess what it does? The result of it brings about something positive. In the, in the end, the end result, that ends up being something positive even though it feels very negative while they're being disciplined. Notice that it says, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. But notice it says this though, unto them which are exercised thereby. So it's, you have to exercise it. That it's only going to yield that if you are exercising thereby. If you're being punished and you're not correcting it, well, it's not going to fix anything. And it's not going to bring about anything good. So you still make the decision. You still decide whether or not you are going to uh, uh, you know, follow the Lord even after He has chastised you. Verse 12, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Go to Isaiah 35.3. Actually, I'll just go there. You stay there. I'll flip back just because we got a lot of verses. That's why I'm talking so fast. i got a lot of material and I don't want it to be uh, too long of a sermon. Isaiah chapter 35 verse 3. It says this, Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. So notice how all, a lot of these are quotations. You know, just reading my Bible, sometimes I'll notice, like, that sounds real familiar, and then I'll look it up. But it's not, it's not worded exactly the same. One, time, one more time, listen. Isaiah 35, 3. Strengthen ye the weak hands, and confirm the feeble knees. And there in Hebrews 12, verse, uh, verse 12, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down. The, the, it's talking about strengthen the weak hands, right? And it says... Uh, the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. And it says, confirm the feeble knees in Isaiah 35, 3. So it's obviously another quotation. Some of those things that you don't notice, that's a quote from the Old Testament. He's quoting scripture like every other verse. Sometimes every verse. And probably a lot that I missed too, I'm sure. I'm sure you may have found some that I haven't found. Verse 13, and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. So uh, it's talking about as a result of being punished. Of course, uh, it's grievous. It can be hard to get over. It's not fun during the time. But he's saying make straight paths for your feet. He's talking about making sure that we're on the straight path, on the straight and narrow path that we're continuing. Not in the sense of salvation, of course, but still following uh, holiness. One thing that this makes me think of, this passage, you know, it's, it's, it's Paul's writings again from Philippians, how he, talks, how he talks about how he follows after that which he is apprehended for. So even though Christ Jesus has already apprehended everything for me, I'm saved. You know what Paul explains in that very chapter is, you know, that maybe I can, I can achieve under the same thing. Hey, I know it's not attainable, and I preached about this in that sermon about how to set goals. You set a higher goal than what you can attain. He explains, I know I'll never do it, but I'm going to try my best to, to, to attain unto what Christ attained unto for me. To apprehend, you know, what he apprehended for me. That's what this is talking about. So he says there, but let it rather be healed. So you don't want to, as a result of being punished by the Lord, you know, turn aside and quit and give up because it can be harsh sometimes, especially if you do something really bad. I mean, it could be a, 
you know, losing a child. I mean, that's one of the examples of God punishing, you know, uh, uh, people in the Bible, David, for a grievous sin. It could be bad, and you could see somebody giving up over that. But he's saying, no, let it rather be healed. It'd be better if you got back on, you know, uh, the path and walked the path. And then it says in verse 14, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Again, that's what I believe that that's referring to. That's actually the verse specifically that makes me think of that Philippians 2 passage. Because he says, uh, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the, the Lord. You know, what is a saint? What does it mean to be a saint? What does it mean to be a saint? What is the word saint? What is another word that's similar unto it in the Bible? Sanctified. It means that you have been sanctified. Saint, sanctified, those words are the same as holy. Saint means sanctified. You know, we call the Bible Holy Bible, right? In Spanish, it's, it's Santa Biblia. That Santa comes from saint. It's the same word, Santa Holy, right? So when it says there, you know, uh, follow peace with all men and holiness, and then it says this, without which no man shall see the Lord. You know, why do we get to go to heaven? Is it because we're holy ourselves personally? No, it's because we have Christ's holiness, because we have His righteousness, and He has sanctified us. So yes, we should still follow holiness and peace. You know, that's, that is the, the virtue and the element that allows us to get to heaven. You know, it's not through our own righteousness, but it's through His righteousness. Right. But you should still try to follow righteousness. He's explaining the importance of it and why you should follow after it, because that's actually what helps you to gain access. So if you want to please God... The more righteous of a life that you live will be pleasing unto the Lord. So yes, no man will see the Lord without holiness. Yes, but it's not going to be his own holiness when he gets to see the Lord. It's just like saying no man without righteousness, no man shall see the Lord. It's basically saying the exact same thing. Without being sanctified, no man shall see the Lord. But he doesn't make himself holy. He doesn't make himself sanctified. God has to do that by his Holy Spirit. That's what does that. That's what sanctifies us is Holy Spirit. That's what makes someone a saint. If they're saved, they have the Holy Spirit, they're set apart, they're sanctified. Look at verse uh, 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Now notice that fail of the grace of God. Now this is uh, uh, going to tie in with the ending portion of Hebrews 10 and Hebrews 6 again. So it's talking about a man that's in the covenant, a man that is saved, a man that, remember, the new covenant is a big part of uh, uh, the book of Hebrews and the importance of it and how it's, uh, you know, God's grace. What would it be to fail of the grace of God? You know, uh, Paul talks about not taking advantage of the grace of God. You know, uh, he says further, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now, this passage will also be used in tandem with Hebrews 10 and Hebrews 6 to try to say, oh, you can lose your salvation. That's not what this is teaching at all. It's the same as Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. Why, did he, why is it being compared unto not finding a place of repentance? Because what does Hebrews 10 tell you if you decide to sin willfully? What does it say? It's the same teaching. It talks about if you sin willfully, that there is no opportunity of a sacrifice or of repentance. It says this in Hebrews chapter 10. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. It says, But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. So it goes on to talk about that you're going to be disciplined by God because you're held to a higher standard being under the new covenant. That's what he goes on to explain because it's by the blood of Christ. It's not by the blood of lambs. God was more lenient if you broke that. God was more lenient if you went in and you sacrificed the lamb and then you went back out and started sinning. God wasn't, wouldn't punish you as strict and as hard and as severe. But in the, under the new covenant, knowing that it took his son's blood to cleanse you of your sin and knowing that that is what allowed you to be able to attain salvation. If you go out and just trod, you know, tread that underfoot, God's going to punish you even harsher. And it's not like, oh, I just go repent and I just go sacrifice another uh, lamb. That's not how it works. For if we sin willfully after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Remember Hebrews chapter 6 talks about the same thing. You would crucify the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. Is the reason why there is just no repentance. In the sense that you can't just go back 
and just say, hey, I want to get resaved. I want the blood of Christ to apply to me all over one more time again. No, it applies to you one time and you're saved forever. But if you choose in your flesh, remember that's what Hebrews 12 is about, living in the flesh, and he'll punish you in the flesh. If you choose to, in your flesh, live a sinful and wicked life and tread the Son of God's blood underfoot, you're going to be punished far more severely. Far more severely than those of the Old Testament who went and sacrificed. They're, we are held to a higher standard. We are held to a higher standard. This is God's personality. Notice that he's using Esau as an example when he goes in there and he begs. You remember he's begging and he's pleading, but what? There was, he was found no place of repentance. You see this happen with King Saul. He got to a point where it's like, no, not listening to him. He would not hear any of his prayers. That's the exact same thing. He was saved. He was anointed by God. Remember, he was, he gave, he was given a new heart, it even tells you. He was a saved man. But what did he do? He decided just to sin willfully. Turned on God and got, he got to a point where God would not hear his prayers. God just constantly and continually punished him severely. Look at verse 18. It says, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and, dark, and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they heard, uh, entreated, in voice that they, I'm sorry, in, excuse me, which voice they that heard entreated that the words should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. That's talking about Mount Sinai when Moses received uh, uh, the covenant. It's talking about the old covenant. That you're not under the old covenant. Notice. What were we just now comparing that to? Hebrews 10 when he talks about how you know, how you're going to be punished more severely under the new covenant than the old covenant. Notice verse 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched. Right? He's saying you're not coming to Mount Sinai. You're not under the old covenant, buddy. You're under the new covenant. You know, what was the mount that wouldn't be touched? Exodus 20 is where the Ten Commandments are given. That's when they're actually written down. Exodus 19 is actually the chapter where, if you, if, you, if you remember the story and everything, he first goes up to the mountain and God writes on the tablets of stone, the tables of stone, he writes them with, you're supposed to wash your hands before you open the door. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he, he, he writes on the table of stones with his fingers, right? God with his finger, with the finger of God. That's Exodus 19. That's when he goes up to the mountain and when all of that happens. When he tells him nobody come near the mountain, not a beast or anything or it'll die. Right? That's Exodus 19 and that's Mount Sinai. So he's saying that's not the mount that you came to. You're not under the old covenant, buddy. You're under the new covenant. Again, what is the warning? It's very clear. You're going to be ju judged more severely. Remember in Hebrews 10, the example that it gives you that, hey, he that despised Moses' law died without witnesses under, I'm sorry, died without mercy under two or three witnesses. David was an example of that. He despised the word of the Lord, right? If you do that in the New Testament, that's willingly sinning. If you just willingly commit some horribly grievous sin, you are going to be punished more severely in this time period than if you would have lived before Christ. So that's what this is teaching. So this should provoke you. That's what he's doing. Remember, endure, patience. This should provoke you and scare you. It should put the fear of God in your heart. Amen. That he is going to, he's going to possibly take your life from you and cut your life short. Look at what it says in verse 21. And so terrible was the sight. Terrible meaning uh, scary. That's what it's saying. Or frightful. It's, it, it instilled terror in people. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So what's his point? If that was so terrible, what's his point? Saying that this, could, this is even, should scare you even more so. Now look at verse 22, further exhorting them. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. Notice this is a different mountain. You have the, the old covenant Mount Sinai. You have the new covenant Mount Zion. And unto the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. You wonder how many angels they are. They're innumerable. That's an interesting verse right there. Uh, verse 23, 
to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. There's a lot there in verse number 23. Again, notice the general assembly. That we're come to the general assembly. It says, and then it repeats the same thing. It says, and church of the firstborn. What is church? It's a general assembly. That's what it is. That's what that means. And it says, in church of the firstborn. Uh, and then it goes on and says this. I want you to notice, because who would you think of when you see firstborn there? Jesus, of course. It's the church of the firstborn. And then it says this, which are written in heaven. Now, is are a singular or plural verb? It's plural. So notice it's not just talking about Christ. Who's it talking about? It's talking about all of those that are in Christ. It's the church of the firstborn. I'm a part of the church you know, of the firstborn. Why? Because I am also the firstborn. Because I am in Christ. That's what that's referring to. I am in Christ. It is the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. There's a, 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 a allusion to, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's directly or indirectly referring to the book of life when he says which are written in heaven. Uh, and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men and they're made perfect. Notice God is the one that did it. They're made perfect. They, God did this. God is the one that cleanses us. Verse 24, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Notice again, better. Oh, that's a theme. It's better. So Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of the sprinkling. It's comparing the old covenant, new covenant. Verse 25, See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape. Now this is very similar to what we saw in uh, Hebrews chapter number 2. How if they didn't escape uh, from uh, the word, who, who refused the word that was spoken by angels, you know, how much worse will it be if they refuse, you know, the Lord's word. It says, if we, it says, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. <clears throat> whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. So that's interesting. He says, But yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. He's saying one more time, I'm going to shake the earth also and heaven. He said I mean, he's only going to do it one time. What's that referring to? Exactly when the heavens and the earth pass away. And then what happens? A new heaven and a new earth. Right? And that's what this actually goes into here in verse 27. And this word, yet once more, signifying the removing of those things that are shaken. As of things that are made, uh, that, th that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So, uh, notice that when he, his voice one more time shakes the earth and the heaven, it says that those things are going to be removed. What does it say about this heaven and this earth? They're going to pass away. Right? So that's what he's talking about here. And then notice the statement at the end of 27 as well. That those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Let's see what those are. Verse 28. Wherefore, we, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. What's the kingdom? It's verse 22, Mount Zion, and it is the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Well, what takes place in Revelation chapter 21? The new heavens and the new earth. Right then at that moment, and that's when the city comes down. That is the new heavens and the new earth. That is the kingdom that cannot be removed. That's the old heaven and the old earth being passed away, and the new heaven and the new earth are being put into place. Amen. And that's what this is referring to, the, you know, the regeneration. Wherefore, we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace. Notice again, just over and over and over again, all the, all the effort and all the time and all the words that are put into to exhort you to do more and to encourage you to do more. Let us have grace whereby, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. You should fear the Lord. You should have a good, healthy fear of God. Look at this chapter. Like the whole chapter is about God's going to chastise you. God is going to punish you. It's about the chastisement of a Christian. That is basically what Hebrews 12 is about. So much of the book of Hebrews is about that. 
the chastisement of a Christian. And God repeatedly tries to put fear into your heart. He tries to say, hey, look at what I did to them. I'm going to do more unto you if you don't live a sinful life. If you willingly sin, if you willingly choose to go out and just, and just do wickedness and, to, and, and just to perform wicked acts and do all types of things, just to forsake the, the assembly, just whatever it may be. Live a sinful, wicked life. God is going to punish you even harder. God is going to punish you even more. Look at the strong language that's used in this passage. About how fearful, how it was a terrible sight. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a, uh, you know, uh, an extremely scary sight. It's a frightful sight. And he says that we should serve him with godly fear. Then it ends with verse 29. Look at that. For our God is a consuming fire. You see that? For our God is a consuming fire. Fire. You know one way? Yeah, God is love. Amen. Do you know what else something that God is? You know what uh, something else is that God is? He is a consuming fire. Amen. In the sense saying that He will kill you. That's what it's talking about. He will burn you. That's what it's talking about. He did that to many people in the Old Testament. Actually through that exactly. He is a consuming fire. It didn't say that it's a different God of the Old Testament. It didn't say, hey, God was a consuming fire, but now He's just gracious and loving in the New Testament. Totally different. You know, now that Jesus came along, it's all about peace and love and happiness, right? No, it says present tense, and nothing has changed since Paul. Our God is a consuming fire. That should put fear in your heart. And you know what? When you serve God, one of the things that should drive you to serve Him and to do what's right every day is the fact that you are fearful of the Lord. Is the fact that you are afraid of God. Is the fact that, you know, maybe you just lack faith. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe you lack faith that God would actually punish you. But let me promise you something. If you are a saved believer, if you are a saved Christian and you decide to live a wicked, sinful life, God will punish you. The God that is a consuming fire. God will possibly take your life. God will make your life miserable. He could cause all types of things to happen to you. Give you a plague, give you, you know, inflammation of diseases and just horribly disgusting types of things that God could cause to come upon you. Right. That's the God of the Bible. Yeah. You know what you need to have in your heart? You need to have the fear of the Lord in your heart. Right. That's what you need to have. People need to stop looking at God like, you know, he's, you know, they'll, they'll use all this irreverent type of language. Oh, you know, Jesus is my daddy. No, Jesus is your Lord. That's what Jesus is. You need to have fear in your heart of God. You need to be afraid of God. You need to wake up and get down on your knees when you pray in the morning and be humble before Him. And, and you know, just like the man that, that goes into the temple to pray, he would not so much as lift up his head. You know why? Because he understood he was humble. But you know what he did? He had a reverence for God. He was afraid of God. You know what needs to be preached from the pulpits more often? The punishment of God. The discipline that a Christian will face. Amen. That's what people need to hear more often. You know, sin runs rampant in churches because people are afraid of the Lord because they don't know what God will do to them. You know what ends up happening? They go and they destroy their lives. They destroy their lives. They destroy their families' lives. They destroy everybody's life around them because they don't have a fear of the Lord. You know, a lot of times it's too late. Yeah, you're afraid after he's punished you. Yeah, you're afraid after, you know, he's, he's you know, uh, uh, came down on you like a ton of bricks. Children also, you know, they put children in, you know, uh, in children's church. And they learn about the cute animals that got on Noah's Ark. And they learn about all these little, you know, types of things. They, they try to tailor the message like it's like in school or something. Where they have a different type of message for each grade, Right? Well, they'll learn about the wrath of the Lord later. They'll learn about, you know, the, you know the, how they need to fear God later. No, kids need to be taught to fear the Lord at a young age. Amen. Kids need to be taught. You need to teach your children the whole Bible. You know, every line of it, line upon line, here a little, there a little. They need to be taught all of the, all of the Word of God. We need to teach our children to fear the Lord. And we ourselves, we need to have a fear of God. Our God is a consuming fire. That's how the chapter ends. I mean, stop and think about that for a minute. What is he telling you? This is what Paul's saying. You should be afraid. You should be afraid, oh Christian. You should be fearful of the Lord. You see what God did in the Old Testament? Oh, you think he's different? No, actually, he'll punish you worse. Actually, he'll punish you even more severely. Isn't that ironic that people are like, oh, God's different in the New Testament? Yeah, he'll punish you even worse now. Right. If you're under the New Covenant, you're going to be punished even worse than you would have been under the Old Covenant. 
Yeah, you're right, he's different. Have you read the book of Revelation? It's the worst culmination of God's wrath and plagues throughout the whole entire Bible. It's like Exodus when he's punishing Pharaoh on steroids. That is the God of the Bible. And he doesn't change from Genesis to Revelation. And at the very end, guess what he is? A consuming fire. You should be afraid of God. And the fear of God is the last point in this chapter that, that Paul uses to hammer home the point of exhortation to serve the Lord. We should serve God, he says, with reverence and godly fear. Do you know why? Do you know why? For, because our God is a consuming fire. The God that you serve is a consuming fire. He is a consuming fire. He will... He, he, he's, he's, let's say this, he is a just God. And if you, de if you decide to live a sinful life, let me promise you this. You will not get away with it. I can guarantee you from the, you know, the top of your head to the bottom of your toes, whatever, you will not get away with it. God will punish you and he will punish you even more severely. You know, the, uh, the Hebrews chapter 12, what is it about? Enduring, patiently. Continue, have patience, endure. He gives you all different types of reasons. What's the last reason? It's to serve God and you should do so with godly fear because He is a terrible God. He's a God that deserves fear and reverence. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank You, dear Lord, that You are, that you are a force to be reckoned with, that You're something that, des that deserves fear. You are someone that deserves honor and reverence, and, and uh, You're powerful, You're almighty, but You're also just, which is, which is a scary combination, dear God. We're thankful for it. Uh, we ask You that You would help us to, when we read Your Word, for things to come alive for us, to prick us in our hearts, to help us to get any sin out of our lives, to, to have a fear of You, a fear that, that we should have. A fe help us to, to, to grow as Christians and to develop a real fear, the real fear that You deserve to have in our lives, more so and more so each day. Help us to move towards what You deserve um, as far as being a terrible God, a God that is worthy and honorable and uh, worthy of fear. We ask You to bless all of those in our church today, dear God. Continue to bless our church. And uh, bless everyone that was here today and all the prayer requests. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. <clears throat>